and good morning, good morning. Welcome to Harvest Church of God. I am so happy everyone could join us this morning. It is a, a little bit cooler of a morning because of all the rain we've got, but that won't stop us from worshiping the Lord, will it? No, we're used to 90 degrees at 68 outside. Let's worship the Lord, amen? <laughs> Would you mind please standing with me? Amen. And please wave and greet your neighbor to your left and your right. Welcome them here in the house of the Lord this morning. And when you have waved to everyone in the house of the Lord, please grab your Bibles and open up to John chapter 1. I want to read verse 4 and 5 with you this morning. John chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. When you get there, say amen. Amen, amen. You still hear Bibles? John chapter 1, verse 4 reads, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Amen, church? God is the light. And I was thinking about this verse this morning. The darkness has not overcome it. The darkness has not overcome it. So even in your darkest times, even when you struggle the most, the light still shines. You're not in complete darkness. You're not overcome because the light still shines. And the darkness has not overcome it. Amen, amen. Let us pray this morning. Father, I am so grateful for your light. I am so grateful that this light has come to us. And that no matter where we struggle, no matter what we're going through, we may think we're in complete darkness, but it is not. Your light still shines. And the world cannot overcome it. You have overcome the darkness, and I am so grateful for that. That's why I continue to ask you to pour out your strength on us, your courage on us, that we can realize that we can overcome this world. No matter what obstacles are in, in, our, in our way, we can overcome it. The darkness is not too much for us. Our struggles are not too much for us. So, Father, I ask you to continue to pour out your spirit upon us. We need you in our lives, more of you every single day to remind us that we can overcome it. So, Father, I ask your anointing upon Pastor Darren as he leads us into your presence with worship. Father, allow us to worship you with all we have, all of our hearts, minds, and body right now, Father. I ask that we worship you with all of that, placing you first in our lives. And Father, I ask you to open our hearts and our minds to the word Pastor Darren will lead, bring to us today. Your word. Use Pastor to bring forth your word to us this morning. I ask all these things in your holy and precious name I pray. Amen. 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 Did you come to give praise and honor to him today? He's worthy, worthy to be praised. Hallelujah. Praise. I want to have praise rising in this place. Continuing today in, in a, a little series of hidden away with God. And today we're going to be, I'm going to be speaking about hear God whisper your name. That's 1 Kings 19th chapter. We're starting at verse 9. And I'm going to be going through verse 14. Scripture says, there he went into a cave and spent the night. And the word of the Lord came to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? 
He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and wonderful, a powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind was there, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face. He went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. Then a voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. Father, I just want to thank you. Your word is great and powerful. It is the only word that stands. It is what we live and breathe. It is our bread, Lord. So I'm asking now that you would let us take this in and live on it. Let it sustain us. Let it, let it grow in us, Lord, so that we could be used by you in your kingdom. Help us, Lord, to know what you want us to know today. And we thank you for your great love. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. You may be seated. You know, many years ago, ministers were taught that as a pastor, you should never tell your congregation about the personal struggles that you have. And as time moved on, there seemed to be kind of a reversal of that role. There was a thought that pastors and ministers should reveal their struggles and difficulties in order to seem more human to the ones that they were ministering to. The Bible tells us about the failures and struggles of the spiritual greats. But I also understand that the Bible is very clear also that we need to be careful because there are many that are not spiritually mature enough to handle the faults and the failures of those that are over them in the Lord. But I believe that God breathed the word into the authors of the Bible and that he knew that we needed to be able to see the depth of those people in the word. We needed to see that the people in the Bible were just people. Think about David. The Bible records his wins, his losses, and huge mistakes for all of us to see. The Bible also shows us Jesus, our God himself, struggling in Gethsemane, becoming short-tempered at times with his disciples, and even violently angry with those in the temple when they were cheating the ones, the, the money changers. What was great, though, is he did all of this without sin. So why are we any better than our master? I want to share a story, a story of a pastor that that shared something with his congregation, how he felt that his, a lot of his life was wasted for the Lord because of circumstances that happened in his life. He got to that point in his life feeling this way. He was a bivocational pastor. He was a paramedic, and he worked for a company. And as that paramedic, he worked uh, very hard for years for that company. And right before Christmas happened, the company, the owner comes to him and says, we're going out of business. He was devastated. Here he had put so much time into helping build this business up. But the owner would not listen to him. The owner ran the company into the ground and eventually had to sell it to another, even worse ambulance company. So he had to go out and apply for a new job at a competitor company. So he went from second in command to rookie on the totem pole. And then at the same time, he started talking about the things that were happening at his first church. He'd been there 13 years. He'd been in a pastoral role, an interim pastoral role for about six years while they went through different senior pastors. And finally, a new senior pastor came. 
He was there, and a large portion of the church did not like the new pastor. So they started going to this associate and saying, complaining and everything. And he had, a, he had a very uncomfortable confrontation with the pastor and the board. So then he took it to prayer. He went to the Lord. And he felt the Lord leading him to resign. He says the Lord told him he needed to resign to allow that new pastor to have his start in a way without having him in the way. The word the Lord gave to him was you need to decrease so he can increase. The problem he had had was there was no lead him where to go after that. He was just told to leave. No direction, no plan for the future. Just obey and leave. And one of the problems, one other problem he had with that was that he was ordained through that local church in the credentials. So as soon as he left it, he had to give up and he was no longer a credentialed minister. He had to give up that title of pastor. So here he was, 36 years old, starting all over in his secular career, and then he felt like his ministry was all gone. The thing that he majorly sacrificed for, he studied for, he went for so many days and so many nights without sleep. He used so much of his vacation just to work in ministry, and poof, it was gone. In both these jobs, he felt like all the work, all the hours, all the studying, and all of it was just a waste of years in his life. You need to understand something, and I know the men can attest to this, that men, especially growing up, you largely find a lot of yourself in your work. When you do your work, it, it kind of defines you. You, you you find yourself in it. It makes you strong. It makes you feel like, hey, I'm doing something. I mean something. And even though this pastor had a healthy family, a healthy marriage, he still felt like he was a life draft out in the middle of the ocean. He was all just drifting along. No hope, no rescue, never seeing land. Well, in the biblical text today, Elijah is in the same position. Here he is, in his case. He's been the only prophetic check against the most wicked kings and queens in Israel's history. Most of his ministerial career had been avoiding the death by, his death by their hands. He repeatedly, they repeatedly ignored his calling, his warnings, his proclamation of God's word over and over again. So God even sends a drought to try to get them to come back and repent to him. This all comes to a head, though, when God has him directly confront the idolatrous religious leaders. When, when, they, when he had to come against those teachers, those priests, as you would say, of Baal, it was going to be some dramatic showdown. Here, Elijah, he proposes a contest. He says, okay. Let's both build altars. We're going to see whose God is real. Okay? We're going to let you do what you're going to do, and then I'm going to do what I'm going to do. So I'm going to pray to the real God. So, of course, they went through and did all this. They're doing all with the water, and he's tell, he pours all water on his, and he does it, and what happens? There's nothing happens. They're cutting themselves. They're doing all kinds of stuff, trying their best to get their false God to respond. But then Elijah prays one prayer. And God answers with fire from heaven. Consumes the whole altar, everything. The people immediately turn away from Baal and they start worshiping God and they execute the false religious leaders. There's revival in the land. And after that confrontation at Mount Carmel, God tells Elijah to pray for rain. And what happens? It rains and the drought ends. So think about Elijah. He's riding high. He's like, yes. We've defeated this, we've done this, we've got revival, things are going great. All of his work, all of his effort is finally paying off. He's finally seeing this reward for his labor. Then a messenger comes. Says, the king and queen are sending assassins to kill you. The revival you thought you started, it's gone. It's out. And what is Elijah? He's devastated. He's exhausted He's emotionally spent, and now he's spiritually spent. 
Has anybody ever had that happen? Feeling emotionally spent, feeling spiritually spent, feeling like what you're doing is just not getting anywhere. You can ride this huge emotional high and all of a sudden the rug gets pulled out from underneath you. And what happens when that happens? What do we do? There's a whole lot of people that just run. They're just like, forget this, I'm out of here, I'm gone. And what does Elijah do? He runs. He runs to the desert. Now, of course, God provides an angel to feed and strengthen him. Tells him to keep going. So for 40 days, here he is. What is he doing? He's going through the journey in this wilderness. And he finds a cave to find rest in. Elijah is alone. He's in the dark. It's cold. And what's ironic is that matches his spiritual condition too. And that's where we pick up this story. Where the Lord comes to him and says, What are you doing here, Elijah? And of course, what does he do? He replies in a really harsh, strong way. I am very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have done all this. They've rejected you. The, all of this. You see his, his whole, if you could see his temperament and his, his anger in this first part. Where he's telling him, you, look what you've done. They've done. Nothing's happening right. So that's why I want to speak to you today. Because we see... That Elijah had to get through some things until he could hear God whisper his name. Last week, we, we learned that we need to be purposeful in getting alone with God. Today, I want to actually speak with, hear God whisper your name about God wanting to get alone with us. But sometimes it takes, some things need to get worked out in here before God can really get alone with us. You know, why does God have the prophet shivering alone in a cave right now? Because spiritual burnout is real. Many have experienced it. Elijah was experiencing it. See, this is about... God who loves you so much that even when you're at your lowest, even when you're questioning him, when you're questioning his plan, when you're angry with him, you feel like screaming into the heavens and asking, why did I waste all this time? The best years of my life are gone. No reward, no fruit, no nothing to show for it. By every human me measure, He's probably thinking, I'm even behind further than I was when I started. See, that's when God needs to pull you out. He'll pull you out of the battle. He'll put you in a cave. And he'll make you sit there until you listen to the whisper of what he wants you to do. I want to break down this text a little bit here as we're going through this. So we can get an idea what was really happening in Elijah's life. Here we have this question. What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, to me, if, we, if you were not really looking through and studying this, you'd kind of wonder, that's a little bit of a strange question for God to ask, isn't it? I mean, wasn't it God that led him there? I mean, doesn't God know all things? So why would he even ask that kind of question? What are you doing here? Well, one of the fascinating things that I love about God and about how Jesus would respond is he rarely answered a question directly. In fact, I think if I was one of the original 12, it may have driven me a little crazy that every time I ask a question, Jesus wants to give me a parable. It's like, just give it to me straight. Just tell me, Lord, right now, tell me where I got to go, what I got to do. Don't make me have to think. <laughs> Don't make me have to go through that. Give it to me straight. Like the rich young ruler. Jesus, give it to me straight. No stories, no parables, no uh, anything else. Just what, is it, what do I do, have to do to gain eternal life? You know, years ago, the American Heart Association did a survey that people who took CPR 
and they took advanced medical classes, only remembered about 10% of what they were taught. So they had to start revamping things, including the way they educated instructors. Everyone had to go to a teaching the teacher class type thing. One of the things that they taught them was not to just regurgitate information to people. Don't just say it over and over to them again. But draw them out. Find out what they already know. And then help fill in the blanks. An example would be in CPR. There's a student stuck. Not understanding what's the next thing I have to do in the sequence. Okay, I've done this, so what else do I have to do? And then they start asking them questions. What do you think needs to happen next? What, look at what you're doing and what do you think needs to happen next? And you come to find out the reason they aren't doing it is because they're missing maybe a little vital piece of information. So then they explore that. They help them figure it out for themselves. And when they do, they remember it forever. So when God is asking Elijah, what are you doing here, Elijah? It isn't so much of asking what location you're in, trying to figure out where you are, but it's to draw out the feelings that Elijah is having, the actions that he's currently doing, the circumstances that led him right there. See, Elijah is responding in anger. I have been very zealous for you, God. I've done it all. Come on. I'm paraphrasing here, but this is what he would probably was saying to the Lord. Please, come on. I've done everything, and now they're tearing everything down. I've done all what you've told me to do, and now my life is even worse. I've got hitmen looking to kill me. And guess what, God? It's because of you. You know, Jeremiah had a similar experience. He said this about God calling him into the ministry as a prophet. You deceived me, Lord. I was deceived. You overpowered me and prevailed. I'm ridiculed all day long. Everyone mocks me. Remember that pastor I was just talking to you about? He said he felt the same way. Just like these mighty men of God did. He had sacrificed so many years for the sake of the Lord and didn't see anything. I mean, he gave up a job offer that, that was a six-figure salary to go into the ministry. He moved out of the area. They could, he could have moved out of the area and become a, a pastor of another church, but it would have left the church that he was in without a pastor, without direction. He was able to even make more money as a paramedic if he would have just been able to do what he wanted to do. He said he would live on a, such a small amount while everybody else was driving new cars. They had all the toys. They gave it all, but he gave it all up to serve God. And now he felt like nothing was happening. See, this is the same place Elijah is, and this is the same place some of us get. We're watching other people. We're watching them succeed and go and go, and we're going, why? Why am I not moving, Lord? But you see, Elijah had a little bit of an attitude also. He was frustrated. So in essence, Elijah is asking, God, what possible benefit comes from me serving you? All it is done is all you've done is make my life worse. Really. If we were, we were saying it today, that's what we would be saying. It's not an explanation that, that Elijah is giving. He's actually accusing God. He's accusing God against the goodness of God. He's having a Job moment. You know Job went through some crazy things. Some difficult things. Family, property, all gone. Left with an incurable skin, painful skin disease. Wife telling him, just kill yourself. Friends call him a rotten sinner. But then God shows up. See, that's what happens with Elijah here. God showed up. He says, Elijah, go stand at the entrance of the cave because I am is about to pass by. 
God is about to come into your life. All you need to do is just stand there and listen. There was a wind, there was a hurricane, there was a tornado force wind coming through, bringing down the mountains, and Elijah's seeing this. Things are flying past him. I can imagine him sitting there and I'm looking at that cave. He's sitting there at the entrance and watching things fall and all these things going on. But God wasn't in that. Then he sees this earthquake, a mighty display of the power of God, but his presence wasn't there. He sees all this other stuff, fire falling, falls all around Elijah. And he's seen fire before from God in his presence. But God wasn't there. He felt the fire, smelled the smoke. But God's presence wasn't there. I can imagine Elijah just trembling in fear, wondering what's coming next. Flood? Plague? What is God going to throw at me next for questioning him? When suddenly there was a whisper, Elijah, Elijah. He felt this overwhelming presence of God enter that cave. In fact, it says when Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and he went and stood at the mouth of the cave. Elijah pulling that over, covering, knowing he's in the awesome presence of God. You understand something. You, you kind of wonder, why, why would it have said that he pulled the cloak over him? Well, if you think about God's presence, it brings spiritual transparency. It's God seeing right through you. He knows where you are. He knows what you're going through. He knows every blemish, every doubt, every sin in our life. But that voice spoke again. What are you doing here, Elijah? See, the first time he answered in anger, but the second answer was a confession and a repentance. Lord, I have been very zealous for you. The Israelites have rejected everything you've done. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. I don't know if you can see this, but this is a principle we should be understanding. It's hard for God to answer our questions when our heart is not right to receive them. See, Elijah wasn't ready on the very first question. He was wanting to get it all out. Otherwise, the Bible talks about it <laughs> casting pearls before swine, scattering seed on hard ground. God has to get us to the point that we get to see who he really is before the truth can sink in. Before it can take root. Before any healing can come to our souls. Before we can even produce fruit for the kingdom. So when God whispers your name, He's trying to get your attention. That's what we need to. We have to get to a point that we're not thinking of ourselves. We're not thinking of all the things that are going on and we're not trying to blame God. But we get to a point where we actually see his true presence. And that's what will change us. The whisper. There's a song by United Pursuit called Met by Love. It says we can run straight into the arms, into your arms unafraid. Because every time we need you, we're met by love. This life can be beat us down to allowing our anger, our disappointment, our hurt, our frustrations to change our view of who God truly is. Isn't that what Elijah was doing? His whole view of God was changed because of all the circumstances that were going on. But our Father is gracious. will bring us to a place where we will be able to hear him whisper our name. He'll be able to restore us back to where we need to be. That's what God was doing with Elijah. His heart was being prepared to see and accept God's provision. See, Elijah got to see this first in his own life. God knows when we're at the end of ourselves. He does. He really does. <laughs> he knows when we have just, whew, we're done. <laughs> We are at that point. It, we, I don't know how much more we can do. That's when you're going to be driven to a place, a place of solitude. So all that anger, 
all that disappointment, all that rage can truly be worked out. Can you imagine what happens with all that rage, all that anger, and all that disappointment if you're not alone with God? If you're just taking it out on everybody else? What does that do to the witness of your life? So God knows what he's doing. (laughs) He'll get you alone. He'll get you alone to a place where you can listen to him. You can hear that whisper. He can tell you what he wants. Now, God will supply your needs. He did with, with, with Elijah. He'll give you just enough to get you where he needs to get you. Now, I know sometimes it may not feel like a blessing. It might mean losing a job. It might mean losing a relationship. It might mean losing something really important to you. But once you see the plan of God, that loss will come insignificant when you get to see the true blessing that's coming from the Lord. But to get there, to get to that point, we have to get our heart back to trusting God. He will supply the spiritual strength we need. God will give you just enough to get you to that place where you are alone, where you are empty, where you are ready to receive from Him. Where you're ready to hear Him whisper your name. You may ask, Pastor, why is it a whisper? You know, there's something intimate about someone who loves you whispering your name. Most of the time, the first time you hear somebody say, I love you, when you're falling in love, most of the time it's a whisper. They're a little afraid to say it anyway. They go, I love you. I love you. When you tuck a child in at night, when you're closing that door or you're going out to turn the light off, what do you say? I love you. When you say goodbye to a loved one, when they go out into eternity, you'll whisper, I love you. There are truly intimate moments in life. Many times are done softly. See, God's whisper is meant to stop us, to clear out the noise in our heart and our soul, to help us so that we will bend our ear towards our Father in heaven. So we can hear the lover of our soul whisper our name. And when our heart is right, then God will show us his plan. Because what does the Bible say? The ground has to be ready for the seed to be planted. This is what happens with Elijah. Because what comes next? Here we have God finally being able to show Elijah, your efforts are not in vain. Here's what he says. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came. Go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Also anoint anoint Jehu son of Nimshi king over Israel. And anoint Elisha son of uh, Shaphat from Abel, Mahalah, to succeed you as the prophet. Jehu will put to death any who escaped from the sword of Haziel, and Elisha will put to death any who escaped the sword of Jehu. Yet I will reserve 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not yet bowed down to Baal, and whose mouths have not kissed him. See, what he's telling you is, Elijah, I'm not done with you yet. I still have a lot for you to do. When the circumstances think that I'm done, everything's finished, my life is over. God may be just saying, I just need to get you to a point, clear you out, so I can pour back into you my love. I can whisper your name and then show you what I really have for you. That none of this has been for naught. See, Elijah had still a lot to do for the Lord. He just had to get his heart right in the place, in the right place. God took him aside, gave him some rest, got him ready for the last days of his ministry so that he could take him directly to heaven. But it could not have happened if Elijah had not heard God whisper his name. There may be some here today that are in a spiritual cave. You're tired. You're exhausted. You may even wonder... 
I know this may seem harsh, but you may wonder why you should even continue on doing things for the Lord. I know you may think, Pastor, that seems a little, but there are people that get to that point. There are people that get to a point when they just, they give up. You see that even when you see it with people that you've seen all your life, they've been living for the Lord, and then all of a sudden, they commit suicide. That's giving up. We have to get our heart right back to a place where we hear God whisper our name, where we're so in tune with him, we know what he wants, where he can share his plan for us to use us in his kingdom, where we can truly feel the presence of God surround us and love on us. We can hear him speak in a still, small voice, telling us, I'm not finished with you yet. We need to make sure that we get alone with God. But we also need to make sure we're prepared for him to get alone with us. I want you to stand with me, please. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It's rough in this world and in this life. It's difficult. Just when you think you've got things going, boom, something else comes. Now, not everybody is in Elijah's position where they're <laughs> angry with the Lord and, and letting him have it. Some are bottling it up, but you're feeling that way. It's not like it's not human for us to feel things. I spoke before. God gives us emotions. He, that's how we get things out. That's how we do. He made us that way. Now that doesn't mean that you get disrespectful to God because he will teach you a lesson. <laughs> but I've said to you that you have to cry out to him. You have to give it out to him. Let him know. He already knows it, but you've got to that's how we get it out. That's how he can show us, like he was just saying, Elijah, where are you? What are you doing here? It's for us to realize. It's, just, it's like having a baby. You have a little baby, and they're crying, and they're crying, and they're crying, and they don't know what they're crying for. You give them a little blow in the face, get their attention, and all of a sudden they're like, they stop crying. It works every time. I do it all the time when I'm having a baby. And, they're, and I know they're not hurting. I know they're not hungry. I know they're just crying because all of a sudden now there's something to do. And you get their attention and you get it off of that. And all of a sudden they're not crying anymore. What is God doing to us? We're getting our eyes all on everything that's around us. All these things that are happening to us. It's just fires falling, mountains falling, everything's falling apart. And then God has to get our attention, get us alone as they listen. sudden we oh wait a minute now I'm in the presence of the Lord now I see that he has it all in control it doesn't matter what's going on out there he still has something for me to do if you're here today and, and you're you're feeling that way I'm not going to embarrass anybody I just don't want us all to bow our heads but I want you to know it's okay to feel frustrated but you can't allow that frustration to stop you from doing what God wants you to do. You've got to get alone with Him, but you also got to let Him heal you to get rid of that frustration, to get rid of that anger so that your heart is open and ready to receive what He has for you in His kingdom. Really think about Elijah I really think about that when he's sitting there in that cave. And God finally shows him and says, this is what I'm really going to do for you. <laughs> Can you imagine?
much how elated he was what he knew God was going to do because he knew God's done it before and he'll do it again Lord I'm asking right now there's hearts of your children here that are hurting they feel like they're at the end of their rope they need to hear you whisper their name they need to hear they need to come to a place and know that you have it all in control. Or they do need to get alone because they need to heal. They need to get alone. They need to, to allow these things to get out. They need to say it to you and then allow you to pour in your healing. To clear them out, clear their mind, clear their heart so you can whisper in and pour in your that we can be used for you. We know you're coming back soon. This world is in those times, it's in those pains, it's in those things that are happening constantly. So we know time is short. So Lord, I'm asking that you would pour out your spirit. Help us to reach the lost. Help us to help those in need. Help us to be alive. That we need to be clear. And we need to be able to hear you whisper our name. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. In your beautiful, precious name. Amen, amen, amen. We all know that God knows it all. But I just love the way. In him knowing it all, he brings his word to touch us where we are. I know some of you may not be in that position, but I know some of you probably are in that position. And God just brings his word, brings back someone else, and shows you, see what I did for them? Now I'm going to do it for you. I'm so grateful for his love. Amen. So grateful for his grace, his mercy for his all and we don't have to do it alone just know that you're not alone amen amen father i ask you just to touch us again as we go from here help us to be all we can be for you in every aspect of our life being good stewards of every part even the love that you share in us to be able to share it to others. Let us make sure that our witness doesn't inhibit that. That love for being shared, to be shared with those around us. Let us be a good steward of that love. Let us show people that you are the only way. Lord, help
help us to be all we can be. Let the words of our mouth, let the meditations of our heart. Lord, let them be acceptable in your sight. Oh, Lord, our strength and our redeemer. We ask this in your beautiful, precious, holy name. Amen, amen, and amen. Hallelujah. I hope you all have a great, great week. Be with us on Wednesday if you can in our Zoom Bible study. It's a great time. If you need any help, please make sure you get a hold of us. But have a great and blessed week. And make sure that you get yourself alone with God and be prepared for Him to be alone with you. Amen? Amen.